Welcome to chapter 8 and then this chapter we will be talking about budgeting for planning and control. It is virtually impossible uh, to talk about cost accounting without talking about the role that budgeting plays in that process. Without a budget, a company is really at the financial wild west, which is where you don't want to be. If you don't have a payroll budget, for example, you have no idea how much overtime you can really afford to have and what that may do to your margins. So if your payroll costs soar because you've got people working at time and a half when you could be using employees that have not yet maybe reached their 40 hours a week to manage additional sort of surges in production, you might be eroding your margins without really understanding it. So in addition to budgeting, we can't just kind of set it and forget it, establish our budget and walk away. We've got to monitor it. We've got to have a feedback loop. Were our benchmarks that we set appropriate? How do we know if it requires adjustment? And so those are things that are central to the budgeting process. Now, hopefully you guys watch the video that I posted in Canvas with regard to Gusano's, which happens to be a favorite uh, Mexican restaurant I had. And I was pretty excited. And if you haven't watched that video yet, I encourage you to stop this one, go to the overview page in Canvas and watch that video. Because um, as a customer, I remember standing in line for two hours on a Friday night because they only had seven little tables and the food was amazing and people were willing to stand in line for seven hours for a taco. Uh, what happened is that they expanded and didn't really have the business know-how. When you have a restaurant and there's only seven tables, was fairly manageable. Once they expanded and they brought in more folks, they just did not at all pay attention to the costs. And it wasn't just that they were not making money and the owners were going into debt, but the quality of the product declined substantially as a result. And so did the customer experience. And I know that our family didn't really continue to go with the same frequency. I certainly would not stand in line for two hours for a table there now. Well, it's better after this little intervention. Uh, it's still not quite what it was initially. And really that had to do with the inability of the owners to translate their know-how into a, a, a business model that they could execute. So they had this intervention from a TV show and I, I will admit that I lurked a lot while this was going on, hoping to sort of catch peeks at what was going on while the production crew was there. Um, but not only did he, uh, the show beef up the, no pun intended, the decor and the um, uh, food selections, but help them understand their cost process. And this slide here talks about kind of the, uh, the follow up to this. And they took some of the advice to heart, perhaps not completely, but the show helped them to understand what the appropriate metrics were. What should your labor costs be for a restaurant of this size? And it was determined that 27% was the appropriate labor cost. They had no idea. They let people work if they needed money and it completely, and what happened was the owners ended up subsidizing all of that and had to take on more debt just to keep overhead going. So this is kind of a local real life example of what happens when the owners are, or managers are not skilled in that budgeting process. Budgeting really has two components, a short-term and a long-term component uh, components. And that long-term component is really driven by a strategic plan or often referred to as a master plan. And the short-term budgetary goals need to align with the long-term goals, which will hopefully also align with the master plan. If you don't have that long-term guiding principle, then your budgeting and operational process is really, it's scattershot. And 
you're not going to be successful as a manager without some sort of systematic methodology to achieve long-term goals. Um, and so, you know, it's also important to check back with your master plan and say, okay, how, how are our benchmarks um, how's our, our success rate or lack thereof going to support our long-term goals? Now, sometimes you don't see immediate success. And I think it's important to also sometimes give things sort of a chance to play themselves out a little bit before implementing something, letting it go on for a couple of weeks and saying, oh no, this was a disaster just because it didn't yield immediate results. Now, sometimes that's warranted, but sometimes you're not going to see the immediate results and you need to kind of stay the course and let things play themselves out a little bit. Uh, so again, this, this master plan is going to give you a framework for how your ideas for your company are going to be taking shape. And I've got a couple of examples I'm going to jump over to. Um, the first time I taught this class, uh, River Valley didn't even have a strategic plan. Uh, but I want to show you really two, um, two different comparisons. Now here is the master plan for the city of Claremont, which I kind of chose uh, at random. And you will see that it has lots of chapters associated with it. And if I just happen to click on one of these, I don't know, we'll click on community facility and there's done in nice little PDFs with lots of nice graphics and Often what you see is data and the data is really important to help the user understand the goals of the master plan and how we got here and where we hope to go from here. And again, this one I just clicked on at random. If you happen to be curious and you go to some of the other ones, you'll see really colorful charts, graphs that help explain uh, help illustrate the points that the master plan is trying to make. Now let's contrast the plan that we just looked at for the city of Claremont with the River Valley strategic plan. And so the first time I taught or this class, there was no strategic plan. So the fact that we have one is certainly an improvement um, over previous semesters. But and I'm, you know, really not looking at it from a functionality standpoint, certainly has strategic goals. But if you look at the individual categories, there's really no data for the most part here to guide anything by. It doesn't talk about how we got here, the current state of our situation and where we go from there. And then the timeline just says ongoing. It doesn't say at this point we're going to assess or reevaluate or or something. And now I will also tell you that when I went to put this lesson together for this, it was the first time that I had seen this. So I think this also illustrates another important point, which is that you've got to get buy-in from your employees and all of the decisions that are made from a departmental basis need to have this strategic plan as their guiding principle. And if you, if your managers and your sort of frontline staff don't understand the holistic goal of the institution or company or whatever it is, it is difficult for them to then employ decision making that honors those goals. So please don't out me to my administration that I have uh, <laughs> critiqued the master plan, uh, but I thought it was important to really contrast those two different styles of master plan, especially against the backdrop of the importance of the master plan in guiding a company's mission. Uh, I'm going to stop this video here and hop over to the next video to start talking about budgeting.